Good morning. It is so good to be here, amen? amen. It is so good. I, I, I like to joke, it's not my phrase, but a brother priest of mine, you know, I'm from Boston, and, uh, you know, why are you laughing? <laughs> he likes to say, uh, up in the Northeast, oh, I'm sorry, I got to watch the monitor. They're timing me for my homily. I don't know why, but that, maybe you'll learn. Land the plane, Father. No, um, <laughs> thanks for laughing at my jokes. People don't laugh back home. I don't know why. But anyways, but in Boston, in, in that northeast part of the country, we like to say, our Father likes to say, and I like to repeat it, we're God's frozen chosen out there, you know? <laughs> you don't have to go to Africa or Papua New Guinea to be a missionary. Just come to the northeast, where God's frozen and chosen. But it's really true. Like, the further you fly west... The, the warmer people are in their greeting and their hospitality. And it's so nice to like walk on the campus and to be greeted. Hello, Father, with a smile. So it's so good to be here. Interestingly enough, it was about 25 years ago, just about 25 years ago, the first time that I stepped foot on this campus. I was a senior in high school. And my parents said, wouldn't it be wonderful if Matthew went to Franciscan University? And I said, what's Franciscan University? And like, oh, it's this wonderful Catholic college, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, uh, all right, well, yeah, I'll, I'll do a, I'll come and see, sure, yeah. You know, I wasn't along, as, as this, I, I didn't know the Lord yet at that point. My senior year in high school. So I remember my friend saying, oh, you're going to college for the weekend? Great, you're going to go to parties and stuff? I'm like, yeah, I hope so, dude. Like, totally, right? <laughs> totally. Well... That all changed quickly when the student who picked me up had rosary beads hanging on the, the, the rear view mirror, just like my parents do. And, and when I met the, greeted the roommate who was going to host me for the weekend, had these divine mercy pictures, just like my parents did, all over their room. And then I was told, oh, we're going to go to Mass. I said, it's only Friday. <laughs> right, okay, so we go to Mass and... And it was a charismatic mass. At that, I'm like, what are they saying? What's this shama mama? Like, what does that mean? But the climax was on Saturday night. I was invited to a double date. I was the fifth wheel on a double date. And before we got in the car, we prayed that God would send angels to protect all four tires that we get to our destination safely to have a good night. You've got to be kidding me. I was like, where did my parents send me for this weekend? Mama Mia. Woo. But I'll tell you something though. Seeds were planted. I wasn't ready for the full immersion in a Franciscan, unfortunately, but I wasn't ready. But it planted seeds. And I know I went home, touched the legitimate, because when I went to Mass on Sunday with my family, I went to Mass with a little different perspective and something, something awakened there. A seed was planted. And it took a while for that seed to grow and many other things in my life. Come to my talk on Mediatrix of Mercy, and you'll hear more about that. Uh, selfish, unselfish. <laughs> But I would say this, I did not know worship, I did not know the Lord, and I certainly wasn't hungering for the Lord. I was struck by the first reading today in the Acts of the Apostles, how the community was worshiping and fasting. They were worshiping and fasting. They were hungry for God. They were hungry for God's will. They were hungry for his power and his purposes. Fasting makes us hungry for the things of heaven. I remember hearing a story from someone talking with a priest, and they were saying how hard it is to fast. And the priest said this, and it was beautiful. He said, you don't fast because you don't feast. You don't fast because you don't feast on the word of God. Fasting is so hard, and I, I stand before you as one who is a struggling faster. I'm a struggling faster. But I know in this hour, it is what we are called. In, in fact, we've always been a church of fasting since the beginning. It flows from our Jewish roots. 
fasting breaks us in our attachments to the things of this world, the kingdom of thingdom. It breaks us of, of self-reliance. It breaks us of comfort, self-medication. We love to be comfortable. Priests love to be comfortable. It's true. We all love to be comfortable. But that's not what the gospel calls us to. Pope Francis is not calling us in this hour to a life of comfort. Fasting breaks us of that comfort and makes us hungry for a movement of God. The scripture says, not by bread alone does man live, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. After Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman in John chapter 6, the apostles were all concerned, Lord, do you want to eat? Did you eat? And he's like, I already ate. I'm all set. And they're like, what did you eat? I didn't see anybody. And he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. We have to enter into that hunger of Jesus. That hunger for God's will. That hunger for God's power and purposes to be released in and through us. Me. A disciple of the Lord. So I come from New England. Tom Brady, Tom Brady country. Love Tom Brady. Big Tom Brady. Tom, just focus on football. Okay? Just focus on football. But Tom Brady, if you know anything about Tom Brady, he's convinced he's going to play into his mid-40s in football, right? Never been done, really, right? But you look at his diet, he eats avocado ice cream. His diet and his exercise routine are, like, incredible. His discipline is incredible. His, his work ethic with his teammates is off the charts. What Tom Brady will do... To win a Super Bowl, will I do to win a soul for Jesus Christ? What Tom Brady will do, and I, I mean no disrespect, will I do for Jesus Christ? I was just listening the other day to a news story. Um, some woman is going to be authoring a, a, a new version of, of Curious George book about Ramadan. And about the Muslim community and how they celebrate Ramadan. And the fasting that's entailed in this. When you hear about what Muslims do during the month of Ramadan in their intense fasting, it's inspiring. It puts us to shame. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the one mediator between God and man. No one can get to heaven but through the blood of Jesus. Jesus who has been so good to us. Will we fast for him? I think it's because we're too full. We're not hungry for God. We're not hungry to see him move. And I say that as much about myself as I say about anyone else. We're not hungry to be that vessel. We're not dependent for, on God. We're not desperate for God. We're too self-sufficient. We're too comfortable. Fasting opens up the door to heaven. Fasting opens up a door to a heavenly perspective. Remember what the Lord said in Samuel? Not as man sees, does God see. He's talking about the calling of David. Not as man sees, does God see. Fasting opens us up to the purposes and power of heaven and to what heaven wants and not to what I want. Father gave a beautiful reflection last night about saying yes. Yes, Lord. And that fasting is a beautiful, powerful tool to enter into that fiat, that fiat of our Blessed Mother Mary. We have to begin, as we take on a heavenly perspective, to make a distinction between facts and truth. Truth is Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is, is by his stripes we are healed. The truth is that Jesus Christ is Lord. The truth is that the Lord God Almighty reigns. That's truth. Facts are things like this. I'm depressed. Facts are things like person has cancer. Person has a three-month sentence to, to live before they pass away because of the cancer. The fact is, is that I don't have a job right now. The fact is, is that this person in my life is not converted. And we can go on with all the facts. But we have to make a distinction between facts and truth. Because facts can change. When a doctor says, you've got three months to live, I'll say, thank you very much. 
and we'll do everything we the doctors tell us to care for that person. But he ain't God. Jesus Christ is Lord. If God wants to heal that person, he will. We've been reading from Elijah the past week. Elijah was told by the widow, there's just a little bit of oil left and a little bit of flour left, and then we're going to die. Elijah was faced with the reality of 450 Baal prophets, and he was the only prophet in Israel. And then Elijah was faced with the fact that the woman's son had died. Those were the facts. Heaven had something different to say. The truth is, the fact is, the fact is, Moses was caught in a hard place. He had the Egyptians on one side of the Red Sea and the other. Those are the facts. The Ethiopian eunuch, he's reading Isaiah 53. He's got no one to share the gospel with him. Those are the facts. David facing Goliath. Goliath, the master warrior, massive giant of a man. David should be squashed. That's the facts. And after Jesus was crucified, all the apostles went away. The facts, he's dead. Those are the facts. But heaven had something very different to say. We have to distinguish between the facts and the truth. And the truth is Jesus Christ is Lord. The truth is that the Elijah multiplied through the power of God the, wine, the oil and the flour. The truth is, through the power of God, he called down fire from heaven and destroyed the 450 prophets of Baal. The truth is, he raised the, the widow's son from the dead. The truth is, the Red Sea was parted. The truth is, David slew the giant. The truth is, is that the Lord sent the deacon, Philip, to evangelize the Ethiopian eunuch. The truth is, Jesus Christ rose on the third day. Hallelujah! The truth is, reality, we get overwhelmed by facts and we don't look to the truth. We don't have a heavenly perspective. We lose heaven's perspective because we're not hungry for a move of God. We're not hungry. We don't believe that God can do something miraculous in this moment. And if we step out, we look kind of foolish, right? Because let's be honest, we're not called to a life of comfort. Life of discipleship is not comforting. It isn't, really. The disciples were pretty radical and zealous and bold, and they stepped out and they looked like fools. Remember what St. Paul said when he, when he started going the route in the Areopagus and talking about how ultimately he tried using lot, philosophy with them, and then ultimately he talks about Jesus raised from the dead. And they're like, oh, nice, we'll hear you another time. Yeah, thank you. And then that's when he made the decision he was going to preach the cross more boldly. Jesus Christ and him crucified. We cannot allow our circumstances to dictate who God is. Amen? Amen? You cannot allow the facts to dictate who God is. Amen? Amen. We need a heavenly perspective because God wants to work in the facts. Now here's the thing. It does, we can't predict how God's going to work. There's no formula because all is mercy, all is grace. There's no formula. I don't know why some people are miraculously healed and then others are not. I don't know. I don't know why some people get prayer novena and they get their job and stuff. I don't know. But I know this. I know that the Lord reigns. And I know he's got power and purposes. I know that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And so my trust is in God. And, and God, if you don't want me to have that job, I Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, if you don't want to heal me, Jesus, I trust in you. It doesn't mean I'm not going to pray for healing. But Jesus, I trust in you because you love me. You gave yourself for me. And your plan is much bigger than my plan. But the key is we got to get into the plan of heaven. Not as man sees does God see. we got to be about the power and purposes of heaven. Amen? Amen. So just to, to sh finish this out, I was visiting a friend the other day. And uh, it was kind of funny because I was like, Lord, I know I want to give this homily. And I would love a really great story. <laughs> and he provided one. As it was happening, I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So I'm visiting friends of mine, and uh, they have a, a next-door neighbor. And um, this next-door neighbor has terminal cancer. And uh, he's had this 
brutal cancer for a number of years. I think the fact that he's been living to this point is the result of many people praying for him. And I've gotten to meet him a few times. Over the, well, anyways, it was kind of late at night. I was getting ready to leave, and he happened to be outside because he's on such uh, pain medication. He, he can't, he's really restless, a lot of pain, tremendous pain because of the cancer is brutal. It's brutal. And, uh, and it's affecting the lungs, and he was, has a very hard time breathing, and he's got this growth thing that's breaking a rib. Really just kind of a horrible situation. You pray for Joe. So I came outside, and he's like, oh, Father, I just need you to say a prayer for me, you know. He goes, it's, just, it's really hard right now. Will you bless my cross? And I blessed his cross. And uh, his children happened to be there, the wife, and a lot of people. And I said, you know what? Can I pray with you? Like, for real? He said, yeah, sure, Father. And I had him sit down. We're out, it's about 10 o'clock at night. We're on this front lawn, okay? And like, his, I, all the family comes out, and then my friends came out. We started praying. And then like, his daughter was like a young adult. Her friends kind of showed up. And she's like running like, okay, you know, like trying to manage that whole thing, you know. And I just started, I started praying like this. I said, I said, we know what the facts are. Like, we know what the facts are. But I want to tell you something. Doctors aren't God. I rever we reverence the medical community. We reverence the medical community. And we do what they ask us to do as long as it's within our morals, right? But they're not God. Jesus Christ is Lord. And if he wants to heal him, he will. God's got power and purposes for this man's life. Most especially to the salvation of his soul. So I start praying. And I pray that God will come down and heal this man. I pray that God will alleviate his suffering. I pray that he'd be able to breathe better. And, I, and in my prayer I'm saying, Lord, we, we understand what the facts are. But Lord, you're God. And you can do something. And we beg you to do something this hour. What the devil has written against Joe has been canceled by the blood of the Lamb has been canceled by the blood of the Lamb. And we're praying, Father, we call to being now that which is not as if it were, as if it, as if it were, because it is in the kingdom, and is now through faith in Jesus' name. Pain be gone now. Be healed in Jesus' name. And we're just calling. Well, anyways, when we finish, I'm not going to say he got miraculously healed, but I'll tell you something. You know what he said to me? He says, Father, I feel 90% better. Hallelujah! Father, I feel 90% better. Father, I couldn't stand up straight. I can stand up straight now. I wasn't breathing well. I'm breathing now. It goes, I can still feel like there's something here, like this little pain here, but it's 90% better. I was like, well, let's pray for 100%. <laughs> I'm like, why is God going to bring you there? And we prayed more, and he, I didn't get 100%. But that's all right. But, I, <laughs> but I'm telling you that because I stepped out, and the Lord didn't, he humbled me. Right? He humbled me. I stepped out. I'm like, all right, Lord, I thought you were going to get my back on that one. All right, whatever. Fine. You're God. You know what you're doing. But you know what that then began to do? That started to give faith to the, his, his family. To which then now one of the siblings says, Mom, you should get prayed with. You're going for a test next week for this, this, and this. You should have... She's like, oh, no, no, no. So, no, Mom, you should. So I pray with her. Right? And we pray for whatever she's going through. And, and then she starts to feel blessed. See, God works. God works. And you know, maybe, maybe that encounter was less about his, his physical thing, although God wants, but maybe it was more about the family be, being awakened to God's love, God's power and purposes, and the God's alive. I am not saying in any way, Father's story was right on, I probably have more hit, misses than hits, okay? There's been many people at the jelly aisle that I've gone by <laughs> that the Lord is like, you should speak to that person. And I'm like, so here's the thing, like, when I'm at conferences like this, I have a minute left. When I'm at conferences like this, I'm praying that God speaks, and then I get a word and everything. And I'm, I'm not afraid, I'll share it. But man, when he starts speaking outside of your comfort zone, you're like, oh, that must have been me. I play footsies with Jesus. So I'm praying this weekend for myself that when he spawns, I'll be a yes man. And I know that if I take fasting more seriously, I'll be able to do it. With great confidence in the mercy of our Father, we offer to Him our prayers.
for Holy Father Pope Francis, that he may be strengthened and renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit to guide and lead the church. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all public authorities, that the Holy Spirit will guide them and lead them in right choices. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all may trust the Lord and know his power to calm all of the storms in each of our lives with his everlasting peace and love. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our For all who are sick, especially our friends and loved ones, that the Lord will bring them comfort and consolation. We pray to the Lord. For the repose of the souls of all those who have died, that they may rest in Christ's peace. We pray to the Lord. For all the prayers we hold in the silence of our hearts. We pray to the Lord. Let us entrust all of our prayers to the powerful intercession of our most blessed Mother Mary, Queen of the Apostles, as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace. Father, we make all of our prayers in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus, who is Lord forever and ever. darkness fills the night it cannot hide the light whom shall I fear you crush the enemy underneath my feet you are my sword and shield though troubles linger still whom shall
Please pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Sanctify with your blessing, we pray, O Lord, the offerings presented here, so that by your grace they may set us on fire with the flame of your love, by which St. Barnabas brought the light of the gospel to the nations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For you have built your church to stand firm on apostolic foundation, to be a lasting sign of your holiness on earth, and offer all humanity your heavenly teaching. Therefore, now and for ages unending, with all the hosts of angels, we sing to you with all our hearts, crying out as we acclaim. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you first.